What's up, guys? Welcome back. We got a short episode for you guys. There's going to be some good stuff that we got to talk about. Not breaking news. This was kind of rumored. And usually where there's a rumor, I would say where there's smoke, there's some fire. And we got... Just, just like Vegas. Oh, we actually saw a crazy fire. Yeah. That was wild. I got it on video. I'll put it in the pod. On the way to the PI. That was nuts. Massive fire. Right outside, the residential buildings got lit up in flames. Thankfully, nobody was in the building, they said, though. Like... It was just one of those. I don't even know what actually happened, but they said no one got hurt, so that's, that's always a good thing. I mean, it, they should have given you like a, a fire warning when they gave you the chain at CFFC, like that it could cause wildfires. <laughs> you mean this whole thing right here? I mean, oh, like, come on, come on. Or the rolly. Oh. It was one of the two. Oh, come on, baby. Come on, I, baby. Come on, baby. <laughs> I mean, there's gonna be some lawsuits coming in. Uh, um. So we want to talk Henry Sayudo, Marlon Cheeto Vera. <laughs> so. Jake's going to tell you to you straight how he feels about oh my God. this matchup, or not even this matchup, what he thinks about Cheeto. You know, okay, I think Cheeto, I hate, I, I say this respectfully because, of course, I'm, I respect all fighters. It's not talking shit, you it's know, just what you think. I think Cheeto's a little overrated. I think he kind of got exposed in his last fight. I, 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 I really thought Corey was going to win that fight, and I, the reasons I, I, I thought he was overrated then, I still think he's a little overrated. I think he has like gotten this hype from these knockouts that he's been getting, but the knockouts he was getting, you've said this a million times, the knockouts he was getting were like against much older dudes with less durability and a lot of those a lot it seemed like a, a big percentage of those fights he was losing, but there was moments in each round where he was kind of stealing the round. What was that Frankie, Rob Font, and Dominic Cruz. Yeah. So then my prediction with Corey was like, well, now he's got a skilled, really skilled opponent who's like technically better at the same thing he's really good at. Yeah. So I was like, I think he was going to get exposed, and he he did. He got, what was it, 50-45 for that fight? Like unanimously? One of them, I think, had it like that. I think it should have been 49-46, but it's, that's neither here nor there. I, I you obviously knew who was winning the fight. Yeah. So here's my thing. I'm going to play devil's advocate, and I'm going to go against the grain. Okay. Even though Cheeto and the guy that him and I have, we've had a little friction. <laughs> um, <laughs> some, <laughs> some a, little, a little friction in the past. Um, but that's because we were definitely on a collision course where if he had won his last fight, he probably could have been my next opponent. Could have been. Could have been. Definitely. You know, right there knocking on the doorstep. Uh, San Hagen won. So here's my thing. In these fights, let's use Jose Aldo. He lost that fight. But he was coming back so strong in that third round where you could create a scenario. Obviously, it's a three-round fight. It's too late. You lost the fight. But you could create the scenario that if that were a five-rounder, and obviously you train different, you prepare different, that... Jose Aldo, who tends to fade as the fight goes on, that's a fight where Cheeto would have benefited from a five-rounder versus a three-rounder fight. Here we are again. This is a situation where he's now fighting in a three-round fight, and that benefits Henry more. Um, but again, I'm trying to give the, the bonus attributes of, of Cheeto, and I think it's the length, the reach. Um, so you got the height advantage. You got the reach advantage. You got the grittiness and the cardio advantage, I think. But can I put can I push back or do Wait, you? Wait, I'm just I'm just giving I'm just giving okay, what okay. I think on paper. Okay. What Cheeto brings to the table. Okay. Stylistically, skill wise, Henry Cejudo is the better fighter. <laughs> Stylistically, in each department, cleaner boxer, I would say technically, um, just a little bit more crisp with the strikes. Um, yeah. Maybe not so much the kicks because the the, var the variety of kicks, I think that favors Cheeto. But then you got the grappling ability of Henry, and then you got the ground game defense ability and even some jiu-jitsu in some unorthodox ways of Cheeto, where he can go for these Kimura locks, which he hit on Brian Keller, Long Island guy, and in a very awkward position, standing up, reaching back behind the cage, and was able to pull it all the way around and kind of fall into this armbar sequence. So yes, I agree with you to an extent that Cheeto was a little overrated, but this is what we got to think about. When we say overrated, are we saying overrated for who, though? Like, in the top five, are we talking over overrated in general that we don't think he's that good, or just against the one guy he fought, we just he stumbled and then all of a sudden it's like I don't think he's that good. That's true. 
So I have to I have to give that fact. Like if I'm Henry, I have to look at all these things as I'm preparing for this fight and look at it from an unbiased perspective. And I think Cheeto has his strengths where I think there's a lot of guys who might be better on paper, but I think he will beat them because of the the, un- the intangible things that you can't really see, which is the heart and that will to win. And on top of that, I guess cardio is an attribute, but I think he uses it to a point where it's a weapon. So I, I feel like, I mean... But he was losing all those fights, so... Right, and and is it is it is it I'm weaponizing cardio or is it I'm a really slow starter and I save my gas tank for the last two rounds when I've lost the first three? You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, what if Henry brings it to him, which I feel like... He he could, and it's not it's not unlikely. That's the game plan. Henry, Henry brings that's it the to game him, plan. pressures him, makes him grapple, defend takedowns, hits him with some hard shots, and I think Henry's gonna get hit with some hard shots. But like, then you're not so fresh in round three, in round four, and round five. Well, this was only a three rounder. That's fucking true. Yeah. So he doesn't have that whole bunch of opportunity to sit there and relax and let the guy tire himself out from punching him. And, you know, it's not like he's getting punched and he's taking a lot of damage. He does a good job of shell blocking with that high guard, but it leaves his body exposed. But if I'm Cheeto, I'm looking at this, and I'm going to give I'm gonna, Cheeto, if Cheeto is listening, I'm giving you the goods, and not to be ripping off of Henry like, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm saying as an analyst, the way I look at this fight, if I'm a coach for Cheeto, I'm going, we have to stay long, and we have to make Henry pay anytime he tries to close that distance with elbows. Anytime he tries to close that distance, we cover and we step in with a hard knee. Something right up the middle and very direct. Henry can't go around with these big hooks because he's going to need to close the distance way too much because of his short alligator arms. And that's why I'm saying on paper, Henry is the more superior guy in terms skills, of that skill, skill set. Wise, yeah. But, he, but the against physical attributes against 125ers, we're talking <laughs> yeah. 135ers. And this is what... And, when, yeah. Uh, Henry wanted to be the backup for myself and Sean, and I go, you just don't want to fight nobody bigger than you again. You don't. Want, you want to fight Marab, and I said it because of Marab. He was like, he wants to fight Marab. He'll wait. I'm like, what you're waiting for is to fight someone who's closer to your stature and size. You don't want to fight the guys who are super tall and going to give you some problems because that was what he struggled with against me. I think if we were the same thing in terms of height and reach, that's a different fight. Like, of course, my physical yeah. ability is what played a big factor in that fight, and I'm not naive to that. And I think that's what Cheeto has to look at. Like, how can I figure out ways to hurt him? And I know what his approach is going to be. He's going to try to close the distance. He's going to try to start fast. If he takes me down, what the heck does Henry do when he takes him down? Is he going to posture up like Corey Sanhagen did in the first round? I mean, probably try to hit him, I would think. Like, ground and pound. Yeah. but I, I And think- I don't feel like Cheeto's so great at jujitsu that he's going to, like, You got to look at Henry. his resume. He's got a lot of submission finishes, man. Yeah, but Henry's like, I feel is... like, I know he's not a great jujitsu guy, but like, I feel like when you have like the wrestling background, it's hard to just bully you on the ground. When you have the wrestling background, it's harder. It's harder to get bullied on the ground. It, even though if you're, if there's a discrepancy in the jujitsu, I still feel like you're strong on the ground. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but you see, as soon as Cheeto gets taken down, he starts throwing these rabbit elbows, which he was doing against Sanhagen. That, yeah. And the beautiful thing that Sanhagen did was he postured up and he squatted over him, and then he started going to town with the strikes, elbows, big punches, where it looked like, yo, this fight might be stopped in the first round. But then you look at it, and you're like, well, Cheeto's mm-hmm. not actually getting hurt that bad because of the way he's so good with his defense. It's almost like he knows I'm going to be in this crappy position. I weather the storm. Okay, it is what it is. I take my time and I come back. So that's what I'm I'm type I'm type looking at for this fight and I'm like this size disadvantage for Henry is going to be a problem. I know he's going to be dreading the fact and putting a lot of emphasis on how do we make sure we don't let this knee touch our chin? How do we not get hook kicked the way that he does all these unorthodox kicks that you don't yeah. really see? It's a closer fight than people think. And no, we, I've been talking to people and they're like, "Oh, they think Cheeto's going to get ran over." I'm like, "Dude, if I'm Cheeto, I got a lot of confidence coming into this one." Yeah, the, the biggest disadvantage is it's a three-round fight because the five-round is a main event between... Come on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just had to. I, had to, I couldn't help myself. I couldn't help myself. Sponsored by Nerd Focus, guys. Come on. Come on. Of course, Henry's coming back. He's going to be saying... 
he had no problems coming back August nineteenth, but he's fighting a three round fight. Yeah. You're fighting it, a five round fight. It's a it's a great fight though, man. I'm looking forward to this one. And I want to see if Henry is as good as he thinks he is for 135. Because when he's fighting these guys, yeah, he fought Dom, who's tall for the weight class as well. But the difference is Dom was a little bit... There's a couple things. He came up for the couch, short notice fight, and he's also older in the department. In a three-round fight, do I think Dom has the ability to still outpoint a guy like Henry? I think so. I think you give him a full training camp, I think Dom can outpoint him all day long. He ain't going to catch him with a kick the way... Uh, Marlon Vera was able to catch him with a kick. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. With styles, it just changes everything. Mm -hmm. But he caught him with a beautiful knee because Don was dipping his head all crazy. But I think that's the difference between um, having a full time to prepare and making a mental mistake where you're a little bit more focused because you're super dialed in from all the prep work that you did. And I think fighters will agree with me when they say the difference between short notice fights and, and having a full training camp. Those are the small nuances where you should have zigged, where you should have zagged, and then you got caught. And sometimes you get lucky. Yeah, what do you think about Corey having to fight Umar and and Cheeto, who lost to Corey, is getting the Henry fight, who's coming off a title fight. It seems like Cheeto's the one getting rewarded <clears throat> when Umar's the harder fight and he's less he's at a way lower ranking. So it's like Corey has way more to lose. I feel like the Corey fight got made first, which is really, really weird. But I think if Corey beats Umar I think the UFC can't deny him because they threw him a tough fight where if Umar wins, Umar's probably getting the next shot. Yeah. Um, especially with me vacating after I smash um, Sugar Tits. So after I smash him, you have a vacant spot where Umar wins. He gets the shot, I guess, maybe more up. I, I would think that's the way you kind of have to do it. That would make logical sense. If that would, Umar beats Corey. If Umar beats Corey. But if Corey beats Umar, I think it's Corey. I, I would have way. I would have. I would have liked to see it have Cheeto be facing Umar, Corey facing Henry. I feel like that would have just been more logical. Yes, but the UFC does things sometimes that we don't always understand. The universe and works in mysterious ways. The universe works in mysterious ways. But to be fair, the UFC also has their war room where they legit have like this spider web conglomerate of weight classes that they're like. If he wins here, we put them here. And if this doesn't happen, then we put this one here. This is hypothetical. If this happens, then this goes right. here. So they have these matchups almost predetermined based on the yeah. outcomes. <clears throat> so, yeah. yeah. So after I smash Sean, we'll see what happens after that. And then uh, we'll see how the fight goes first, man. And then, But I have every intention of just... Oof. Like, the guy's good, but I, I just want to... When you when you faced off with him and you Smash. look in his eyes, like what do you? Um, what do you see? I think he got. I felt like he was maybe pumped up from watching the fight, thinking like this is how our fight's gonna be. I'm like, dude, we're talking about a guy who's five foot five, maybe five four, and yours five foot ten. It's a completely different stylistic matchup. Yeah, you know how hard it is for me to shoot under a guy who's this yay high to the ground mm -hmm. versus someone who's this high. When all I need to do is just reach and grab. It's a big difference. I get past your arms when you try to throw these strikes. Don't miss, bro. If you miss, dude, good, good bro. freaking luck. That's it. That's all I got to say about that. All right. You wanted to talk about. Oh, John Jones, Francis Ngano. They finally got it right over there. Who is the king? Who is really the king of Wakanda? That's an interesting. I haven't heard that one. Who's really the king of Wakanda? I don't Who know. Who do you think would actually win in that if they actually fought each other in MMA, like in five S months? If they, if it see, got announced and then five months from now they have a fight. See, now with this exact scenario, my intuition would lean towards the better grappler, the same way like Cyril Gaon, light on his toes, but you get taken down. I'm not saying Francis can't grapple, but we don't know what Francis's ability looks like to get up from his back if he were to get taken down. <clears throat> we know he's going to be super strong there, and John, I'm sure, is preparing for that. What I don't like is that it took three years for John to get here, respectfully, because when they had the face-off, he brought that up, and, and Gano said, I've been here waiting for you for three years. And I'm like, ooh, you got a point there. You have a very valid point. And then John said, I needed three, three years to get big enough to kick your ass. And I was like, ooh, you got a point there too, but... 
I kind of I kind of lead towards but isn't Francis. Isn't that kind of like? Yeah, I kind of lead towards Francis because I'm like he's older. Three years later, he's even older now, and then. Like yeah, I get now you make the playing fields e- equal, but now you got youth on your side versus the older guy, and you had more time to to rest. How old is Francis? I'm not saying Francis was super super active, but he had the knee surgery. Uh, he fought Stipe. He then fought um, Surugan, yeah. and that was his last fight, right? Surreal, yeah. Surugan. So he hasn't fought in a while either, but I think taking three years off, coming back and then dominating. Yeah, that I feel like John could have done that. Literally with less than a year of bulking up. And I'm not saying like respectfully, like he has his process, right? But I still think he's that damn good where he could have done that. Cause he's not a small light heavyweight. He cuts down right. from what I remember, like two thirty, and I've heard he's been even heavier than that. Mm-hmm. So how much bigger is he now? Maybe he just carries the weight better now. Okay, that's fair. But at the same time, I'm thinking his skill set. Would have been good enough. I'm like, yeah. I don't think he would have let Francis hit him at being lighter, more nimble mm-hmm. than he is now, being heavier and maybe a touch slower. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, like Francis has a better <laughs> chance of hitting him now, maybe. I, I don't want to say that, but I just think I just hate that we had to wait three years, and yeah. now we're probably never gonna ever get it's to see this. It's never gonna happen. It, it's it's kind of trash now, to me. Like, cause who's Deon- to blame? I think the I don't blame John. I don't blame Francis. I think they both have their very valid points. Well, like, it was going to happen. Remember? Do you remember there was, like, a, a while ago it was supposed to happen, but John was, like, holding out for a certain amount of money? Oh, something like that. And He then, wanted, like, $20 million. And then DC, not DC, uh, Dana was saying that he was scared. Yeah, and then. He's like, if you want to fight, you want to fight. But when you make, like, demands like that, that clearly you don't want to fight. I'm like, well, this is prize fighting. We fight for money. I mean, but what I, I kind of see his point there just because it's like you're asking for money that, like no one's gonna get that unless it's Connor. Yeah. But even then, it's gonna be. I don't like, know if the Connor's getting that. Yeah. To be honest. So it's like respectfully, it, and he said he compared it to boxing, like Tyson Fury versus Deontay Wilder sold X amount of pay per views, and this is what mon- the money they got. But then, this isn't boxing. It's, it's not, not boxing. The same thing. But when you compare the numbers and the revenue streams, when you do look at all those things, one does have to wonder, well, why can't we get that? So they they both have fair yeah. arguments. No, you know? they do. Yeah, very very fair arguments. But at the end of the day, it's the UFC show, and what I like is that the UFC prides themselves on making the best fights when people want to see and when they matter. We missed the one with Fedor Emelianenko versus Brock Lesnar at heavyweight, and you're telling me again we're gonna miss John Jones versus. Freaking Francis and Gano? That fight would have done so many pay per views. What are, what are we even it talking would have, about? Like stopped the world. Like. If you can go cross over and make a boxing fight with Mayweather and Conor happen, why can't we do something like that with PFL? A one-off thing where both parties win. Well, because then P- cause they don't want P- – PFL gains so much more. Why? You're making one super fight. You did that with boxing. Does boxing gain so much more? It's like – Did boxing gain so much more? Like after that Conor fight happened, then what happened to boxing? You see what I'm saying? So why can't this be something similar? Nah, There's but, enough money on the table but I for think everybody. Boxing, Boxing – it it didn't gain much because boxing is in shambles, but MMA I feel like nah come on because it's in shambles yeah what like it's such an individual the there's no like central are you comparing basketball right now hmm? what are we talking about what are we cent- so wait am I crazy for saying boxing is in shambles I think so really yeah okay I think everyone not, would agree not, with it's me it's not it's not the most interesting it's, it's sport. not very organized I'm saying and it's it's not it's on the decline in terms of popularity. Maybe right now there's like a little bit of a resurgence. They're putting yeah, on really good fights. Yeah, because they're putting on some good fights yeah. that people actually want to see. But at that point, everyone was saying, I mean. Boxing is dead is what the yes. term was people was using. Yeah. And I think it was. And like Dana tried to go get into boxing and he and he pulled out because he he said it was so disorganized and it was a shit show. That's what I'm referring to. Well, so like I feel like they didn't. And they, there's so much self-interest. This is what I hear. There's so much self-interest that they didn't really like even try to like build something off that Floyd Connor fight. <sighs> There's self interest in the UFC as well. So it's like what are we talking but about? But there is also a long term vision for the sport. Of course. You naturally. Know? I think and, there has and, to be and preserving the Otherwise the, we the, wouldn't be here. Like the I think the UFC's goal is to have the UFC kill all these other companies because if if these other companies get big enough to like 
run things a little bit or have their own pull and power, then it becomes more like boxing where there's all these different organizations that ruin the sport and they try to preserve their guys and build these guys up with padded records. And that's like the, all the complaints about boxing. Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with that unless it gets until, unless the, the if the end goal, and this is only, you can only know this from the internal people who, who are running things, if the end goal is to eventually have their champ or their top guys cross over and fight the other guys, where it's like the WBO, CBC, whatever, like there's a whole bunch of different belts, which I don't understand. So I don't know what is the premier boxing league. Like the UFC, we know the premier boxing organization it's the UFC. Right. So what if everyone what would... if Francis knocks out John Jones? But see, when you have multiple organizations, I feel there's also ways for the top guys in boxing to get paid the way they do and get taken care of the way they do, right? It's, it's definitely better for you guys. Yes. I'm saying I don't think the UFC wants that at all because they want all the power, they want to control everything because I think they think that if the other organizations get the power, where they can like control some of the market and have influence over it, then it kind of just ruins the whole sport. Cause that's again, cause that's what happened to boxing. But I feel like boxing had all those multiple organizations since decades ago. So I don't think that's something like that just happened overnight, like top rank and all these other ones. <sighs> Look at like boxing MLB, promotions. NBA. There's no like competing organizations and they've been around the longest. And they're still crushing it. So they're one umbrella. Like I just went to a baseball game the other day. I know we would we would sit here from our perspective and say MLB is dead. Like who the hell watches baseball? It's such a boring sport. I went there on a Tuesday night and there was thirty thousand people at a Cubs game. Yeah. Well, so what's the comparison here? So it's not dead. I, my point is like. So you're saying boxing isn't dead? What's, what's your tie right now? I'm trying, I'm trying to. No, I'm saying tie when you when right you have now. all these different leagues, it I think it kind of can ruin the longevity of the sport. I see your point. But this is where I'm also saying, well, boxing will eventually have those crossovers where they feel is at the right time so that everyone can make as much money as possible. At the end of the goal, like the goal of the organization is to make fights to make as much money as possible, right? Forever, though. Forever. So my thing is, why would it be such a bad thing for the UFC to once again do another one-off fight like they did for boxing. They did it with James Tony, right? Coming into MMA, and he got crushed by Randy Couture. They did it with Conor going over to boxing, and I think he fairly uh, held his own. A lot of people say Mayweather carried him. I just think size played a big advantage for Conor to stay in the fight that long. If he had better cardio, I think... Boxing cardio, he could have went all 12 rounds. Mm -hmm. uh, but eventually, cardio plays a factor. It's just not your world, especially yeah. with, even with the, the size advantage. He looks so much bigger than Mayweather in there. And then for this, I feel they could do some type of way where it's like, okay, we'll do this fight. Maybe we take, we'll give you 10% to PFL of the pay-per-view share, and we'll take the 90% of the pay-per-view share. And I think maybe they just do it with John Jones and Fr um, Francis on the card where only them will get pay-per-view points. And then from there, I think that could be a win-win where there's so much meat on the bone where I think it can work. I think it's just whether or not the UFC wants to go out of the way to say, we're willing to work with another organization to make one crossover fight and after this, don't come back towards us, to us. But then what if... We want to show you that we have... We want to show you that we have the king. Okay. You know but, what I mean? Right. That's the way I would look at it yeah, if I'm the UFC, but they're course. not looking at it like that. We want to just be like, nope, you should have stayed here. Well, yeah. they, they, I, I think they, they, they stand to lose way more than the PFL does. Like, even if, even if the PFL's heavyweight guy loses, Francis, yeah. even if John beats Francis, they still gain a ton of exposure and yeah. money. And it makes them – now you just built up your competitor. That's the, like you giving Sean, like, 20 pounds of muscle. So – so the UFC once did a thing with Cheeto. Uh, not Cheeto. The UFC once did a thing with Chuck Liddell going over to Pride to fight. And this was like a crazy story. I forget. Rampage tells it best. And uh, what I remember... Chuck I, Liddell went over to Pride. They, like, they sent like to say, like, our guy could beat your guy. And I think ever since then, they kind of stopped doing that um, promotion versus promotion crossover. 
Because if I remember correctly, Chuck lost. I mean, we could just look this up. But I know there was something that happened. It was either Tito or Chuck Liddell. But I'm pretty sure it was Chuck Liddell. And I think he was in the tournament. And I think he ended up getting knocked out, if I'm not mistaken. But I think that has somewhat to do with it in terms of their experience over the years where they're like, like you said, they stand more to lose where they're like, yo, I don't want my guy to lose because now people might look at our guy as not the real champ. But then we have other organizations where we have this pseudo, we have this pseudo thing where people just automatically think the champion at the UFC could just automatically be all the champions in all the other organizations. And I'm sitting here. And I'm going to say, that is Cap. Well, really? That is Cap. Because of Francis. I think there's, I think there's competitive weight classes. Uh, I think 35 is competitive with Patchy and Sergio Pettis. I think, and Styles make fights. I think Usman Nurmagomedov, who's the champ, I believe, at 155. I think that's competitive. I forget who's at 145. Or maybe Usman's at 45. So, uh I think Usman's 45 or 55. He fought Wait, I think Benson Usman's Henson. about to fight for the title. No, nah, he fought Benson Henderson Because isn't title. Pitbull 55 and 45 champion? He was, and then he went down so that his brother could fight for the belt. Okay. Something okay. like that. Okay. Uh, but if I'm not mistaken, he beat Benson Henderson for the world title. Okay. And I think that was 155. So I'm going to say yeah. Usman 155. And then I think maybe it stops right there. But then you have Ryzen and you have 1FC. Ryzen right now, they're about to crown their Grand Prix champion, I think. <laughs> Juan Archuleta is in that weight class. And Juan's a dog. You've Juan's seen him train. Beast, yeah. So Juan could easily be a top, top five. Top seven. guy in the yeah, UFC. Yeah. Like it, you know what I mean? So if people that know MMA, they're gonna know. Like, no, I, but there are like there are like outliers and yeah. it, it's spread out throughout the other organizations. But we are the deepest. But yeah, exactly. We are the deepest right. roster for but, And there are guys who would come over from Bellator or, or PFL and like Run some numbers up in the UFC. Yeah, Michael Chandler's a Bellator guy. Yeah, yeah. And he lost to Eddie Alvarez. Eddie Alvarez was a former UFC champion. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. He it's, beat it's, RDA. Yeah. I just, and then Connor beat him. So do you think John would beat Francis? I I, I I think, and I gotta I gotta choose my words very carefully here because I I know both guys, and uh, I'm not trying to I'm not trying to ruffle the feathers at all. I think we know who the better grappler is, and we know who has the ultimate equalizer in the power, and we know who's striking isn't the cleanest, which is obviously John. And he even said, "I look, I felt goofy or clumsy in there when he was throwing his punches." And when you watch it, John, yeah, he threw like this body punch at Surugan where it's just completely like whiff, where you're like, "Dude, where were you even aiming at?" Um, it was just so off target, but it felt like, like he said, it felt goofy. It looked, it looked, it looked it. Yeah. But you know? I would I would think John's a little cleaner than Francis, no? Like all around Muay Thai and maybe it was the new weight class. The way he looked I'm just talking about this one. Sure, like, okay, okay. I'm saying all his other fights, John is a very unorthodox striker. He's clean. He might not be a combination like I don't fight in combinations, right? John doesn't fight in combinations. No. But he'll chip at you. Um, these crescent kicks, um, these these knee teeps, uh front kicks, he'll throw like this windmill axe kick. He'll throw these long jabs. He'll go to the body. Then he'll step in with the elbow. So he's almost like a sniper mm -hmm. versus someone who's in there. Where Francis, Francis is probably going to go one, two, three and throw these big shots and hopefully something hits you and detonates and explodes and you just get sent to the next dimension. <sighs> That's the way Francis fights. You see what I mean? Yeah. Where John is very different. So when I look at it stylistically, John is not the better striker, but he's a sniper. He can pick his shots. But when you watch the Cyril Gon fight, that long layup looked like it definitely played some factor in that. And maybe because him back. he's yeah. probably worried about the power coming back towards his way with four ounce glove versus boxing gloves yeah. and sparring. Yeah. So these are the things that I think about as an athlete because I'm on the inside and I know that's what you're probably thinking in terms of the emotion. I'm like, if I'm in that situation, why am I throwing a punch that looks like that when I can really just sit here, close the distance and throw something a lot cleaner and it's maybe the hesitancy of that. So that's the way I look at it. Sure. And uh, and obviously, if the fight hits the ground, whether it's a trip or a single leg of running the pipe from John Jones, he throws spinning elbows off of those attacks. It takes one elbow to change the fight, and if he gets the ground, the fight to the ground. Honestly, I've seen John grapple when he just got started, and he he's a good grappler. And even now, I would say he's a lot better because he put so much time into yeah. the grappling. So, I think it just depends, and that's why it's a fight. That's why we would like to see it happen because we want to know. 
Can John avoid the power and the nuclear detonators in these hands and get the takedown? Yeah. Or will he get hit with these nuclear detonators and get sent to a next dimension? Yeah. And that's the fight. That's why people love the fights because that, that they want to be... see you against this person and see you against right. this person and see what will happen. It's the game, man. It would be dope, but I just know they're never going to do it. I know. Unfortunately. I know. And I kind of get why they won't. <clears throat> I get why. I get why, too. I, I think mean, it would be kind of a not. It wouldn't be good for the UFC's long term. If they vision. were to lose. Yeah, or to give power to the guy who you don't want competing with you in 10 years. You want this mother f gone, you know? I think the UFC brand name of those three letters, UFC, is so strong that no one's going to ever, ever come close to outdoing them. The way the UFC is so well ran with their production, I'm telling you, the UFC is a monster. It's, oh, yeah, of course. The but you see the behind they can't the scenes? Get, like, they can't get complacent where it's like the, you're I don't, focusing you, all you your energy. The UFC is going to be complacent? There's people who think so. They let people go all the, the time and bring in new guys all the time. Bro, there's people who think like there's pe there's a there's a group of there's noise. Ah, how do I phrase this? There's definitely people who think the UFC is getting a little complacent and putting on like weak oh, cards, shit, like weak cards. Putting out putting out so much energy on the power slap when they could just focus on the main thing. Yeah. Um, that's fair. Not I, getting the Connor fight done, not getting the the John versus Francis fight done, not having a, a a a fight in Mexico with all the Mexican champs. Like, there's people who point to all those things. I'm not saying I. This is what I think, but yeah. there are people who point to all that and they're like, and then they that's, see all the stuff the UFC is doing with Power Slap and all the influencers they're paying to promote Power Slap, and it's like, yeah. Let's take a let's take a look at the Mexico thing. To to do an event somewhere, you have to have contractual obligations first. And you have to have those events picked out usually months in advance because they book out their talent with sure. other stuff. So it's not as simple as saying, I'm just going to go to no, Mexico. No, of course. So I'm just saying, I'm playing devil's advocate here. Right. I'm like, I'm speaking for the UFC. I'm like, I can see why they didn't go to Mexico this year. And if things stay the same, I can see them looking at it like, well, if we're going to target Mexico, this is a time that we can fit it into our schedule for 2024. You see what I mean? But, but people yeah, don't, no, they yeah. don't see all of course, these other things. But people might also come back to that and say, well, if they weren't putting all this energy into Power Slap, they might have, have had the wherewithal to get it done. But what does one have to do with the other is what I mean. They have so many different because departments. Because they're using the UFC's resources to build Power Slap. But see, that's, that's ignorant to say that because they have so many different departments. They have a media team that's dedicated to the Power Slap. Then they have a, me, uh, a separate team. No, that, I've talked to people. That, uh, I don't know I, if I, I should a, say I that. have a separate team that they have a separate team that does the event planning and they'll pick out locations of where they want to go. And the UFC is involved, like Dana Hunter and uh, the, the higher ups are involved in like, yo, we think we should try to go here and we think we can make this work. Vancouver, they have con contractual obligations. Every November, they need to go to Madison Square Garden right. kind of thing. They have a certain thing with December for some reason. We're always in, in Vegas. Like these are things that people don't know about. So to say that one has to do with the other is, I, I think it's they think it has more weight than it actually does in terms Probably. of the way it affects like that type of planning. But the other thing they were saying about the weak cards, I agree with that. Because think about it. But you have but, the Dana White contender series. Wait, go ahead. Uh, the weak cards, I think, is ignorant to complain about because it's like, well, you're getting 48 of them per year. We could make all the cards as strong as they all used to be, but there would be like 14 or 15. Oh yeah. Year. So like we and could do. I would rather have UFC every week and have a li have it spread out more than have. You what know, do you want Gilbert Burns to fight every other weekend? Right. It's like it's not possible. No, I would. It's not possible. I I like it how it is now versus the idea of having one pay per view a month and that's it for UFC. You know, I like this weekly cadence they have. But usually they do like forty eight events a year. Forties anywhere from like. Right now with the been ESPN like 46 deal. Forty six to forty eight events a year. Right, but before I'm saying. That so that's why I think the cards are weak because it's hard. It's there's just like there's not that many stars to but spread throughout forty eight cards. There's not, but at the same time, it's been like that for the past few years. If you actually go down history, and you see like the UFC has had that strength of schedule for maybe the last eight years. I don't feel like it's that. I, mean, much I got in at twenty fourteen, and I've been watching since well before that, and they've had. They would do announcements, and this is when I was watching, reading all the media blo um, blogs before I got in to the UFC, like seeing where I was ranked and everything. This is when I followed religiously. I was watching all these different things to see what news would come out, and they were upping the amount of events they were doing. It was like 30, then 36, and then got to 40, and then it was like 48. So 
yeah, you're right. You don't have stars for everything. But then you you have an opportunity to build stars with these other people from the contender series. But at the same time, these guys aren't so talented because they're so green in their career. They haven't had much time to develop because they're coming in so early, 5-0, and 6-0. and I came in at 8-0. and I still think that I was underdeveloped. I learned how to, like, do stand-up. Like, even though I did stand-up in the gym, I learned how to do stand-up in the cage during my time with the UFC. Right. Like, I grew up with the company. Charles Oliveira grew up with the company and became who he is today. It's actually so crazy. Yeah. So now you see these other guys, you, it's so hard to stay here. They mm. lose two fights and they get cut. And it's like, damn, you didn't even get a chance to really even, like, get the wheels turning. Like, yeah. It sucks. Like, But I, yeah. I get it. They have so much talent that they're just churning them out. So it's like you make money on that end from the contender series and you get you get people who are kind of popular from your exposure and get people excited and hyped about them to see them when they make their debut. They make their debut and you see some of these guys and you're like, it looked a lot better on the contender series. Why is that? Because the contender series, it was two guys just fighting for a contract and it wasn't really like about the skill. And then we get here where people are less concerned about that. They're fighting more talented guys who have more comfort in terms of their security with their job, you find out real quick if you're good enough to to play with these big boys or you need a lot of work. So you're saying because they throw all these contender series guys <laughs> on the cards and even the guys who they they even like f- put guys on these these fight nights that didn't make it on contender series, but they just bring them in to fill the card. Yeah, yeah. But Dennis can't get a con. I don't. That's a whole other thing. <laughs> That's separate. I ain't even gonna do him <laughs> like that because I think that might be part of the reason why they, yeah, I'm gonna leave yeah, it alone. I'm gonna leave it yeah, alone. Yeah. But yeah, man, that's that's the game right now. So yeah, people will say a lot of things, but there's so much that goes on behind the scenes. And I had to learn that because trust me, I was that angry person like, I don't get it. Rah, 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 and I was just barking. And then when you start to meet people, you have conversations with some of these higher up guys and you start to learn how the things work. I'm like, Oh, you guys are actually a monster. This isn't like People think it's just like, yeah, get a couple guys together and we're going to do a fight. Like, no. These guys got production. They got people with the cores. They got people on top of the thing, the bottom. They got reactions. They got coaches' reactions. They do all these things that people don't even see that makes the show. And then even when they do promo, they got all these different angles that you didn't even get to see. And then you get to see highlights. And it's just there on a hard drive somewhere. It's just there for you. No, as a fan, it's just you just see it and you just think it is what it is. Yeah. it's actually like a, a whole beast of a thing that's all these gears are spinning at the same time. Like they're getting ready. They're getting this card. They're getting all the, what is it called? The countdowns shot for one card. And then these, those same guys are going to get on a plane and go film another guy for another card. Dude, it's, it's an operation. And man. like it's there's, an that's operation. one team of guys. And then there's the embedded guys. And then there's these guys who film these interviews. And then Content. Megan Olivia's going Content. over there. Content. Also, all these guys who do the UFC production, they're doing like little shows on Fight Pass, like yeah. CFFC. Yeah. Or yeah, like other all those other ones, like the LFA. That's why I don't even know how they even have time for Power Slap, but that's what makes me appreciate. Like, not trying to, not trying to, I'm not sucking Dana White at all right now. But this is why I appreciate him because he knows what it takes to run a show, and I've heard him always say like. You guys don't have no effing clue what you're talking about. They don't have any idea what it's like, how it is to put on a, a good show. And then I never understood what that meant. And now I get it. Like, I got it a while ago. But that's why I always got to be like, dude, you got to slow down when people start saying stuff like that. Like, you actually don't know what you're talking about. There's a lot that goes on yeah. behind the scenes that they don't talk about or spend, like, it's unappreciated stuff that like, just gets taken for granted. But it's all the little, and I, that's why even when I do my interviews, like, post fight, like, Dude, man, I got so much respect to all the people that make up the staff of the UFC because they are the backbone of the company, and they don't—I don't think they get anywhere near the amount of love that they should mm-hmm. because they keep the wheels and they keep the lights on, man. It, it's really those guys. Yeah, but, a lot of guys who build up the cards and are responsible for all that content. Shit, I thought about doing doing something, and I was like, I started remembering all the stuff that they were doing. I'm like, dude, that just sounds like a disaster. Like, I, I. I wouldn't even know where to begin. Doing something. Like a promotion. Oh. And I was like, ah. I was like, ah, I don't know. Maybe this is not for me. Yeah, imagine running a local show 40, like 12 months a year. I could do a local show. I wouldn't do that much. But I, I think a local show. Like a ring of combat. Where if I, yeah, I think if you did six events or seven or eight, whatever it is, something like that around that ballpark, 
I think the main thing, the challenge is the production. Who's going to man the cameras? How do you record everything? Get it to the streaming services. Make sure the streaming service doesn't suck and chip out. Oh, my ESPN app is not working. Oh, I paid all this money. and it's... Yo, These things, these are real life things that people have to deal with and make sure that doesn't happen to millions of people who are all across the world in different countries yeah. trying to stream the fight. You see what I mean? So th when I say it's a monster, it, dude, this is a monster. No, it it's is. not as simple as like, yeah, we got fights on. But they should have got like. they should have got the Mexico City card done though. <laughs> hey, maybe they should have. Maybe they should have. I'm I'm no, nah, I'm kidding. I, maybe I mean they, I have no idea what, me what that takes. Like But, maybe but Dana they did say they dropped the ball, but yeah, a lot of fans. And he probably could've... missed the boat like getting an event. He'd probably have to cancel something in order to make that happen. Well it's all yeah, I mean fans just they don't really yeah, again, they don't see a quarter of what goes into it. Sometimes it's good to just sit back and enjoy the show. Yeah. That's why when fans do boo and stuff like that, I don't get mad. I'm like, hey, you earned your right to, you spent your money to, to. I'm like, as long as you're not getting disrespectful to the point where like you're attacking, threatening my family, then we're good, dude. Because right. I don't know if that threat is for real or not. Then I gotta, I might have to do you something. You gotta act about like it. a man if if someone says something like that about your family. You have yeah. To, like, you have to sit there and take it seriously. Yeah, I, I would think it'd be naive not to. Yeah, because you never. There's psychos there's out here. There's a lot of psychos out there, especially UFC fans. It's an interesting batch of human beings. Yeah, speaking of that, it's like the uh, whatever. Um, what? We'll let that go. 